So we've seen that uh, knowledge is, scientific knowledge is organized in paradigms. And uh, the question now is to try to understand how we get to the current uh, paradigm. Uh, so, you know, paradigm, as we said, it's a set of it's a theory, a set of um, research questions and facts and norms that, has, that are shared uh, universally uh, among a community of scientists, or almost universally. Uh, so the question is, how do we get to that current prevailing paradigm? So when we're in school, we take science classes. Um, often science is described as this cumulative exercise where over time, we learn more and more, we discover more and more, you know, there's scientific progress. So we're just improving more and more. So, you know, it's as if you had a big wall, you know, just adding bricks to it and the wall is higher and higher. Um, but that's quite a misleading picture. Uh, in practice, science doesn't evolve linearly like that. It's not just a cumulative, uh, in fact, it's not, it's not really a cumulative exercise. That's something that Kuhn was uh, the first to isolate. Uh, in fact, science is much more uh, cyclical and you have periods of creation and improvement, but you also have periods of uh, destruction. Uh, you have to scratch what you knew and kind of start fresh. Um, so how does this scientific cycle um, looks like? Um, so Kuhn isolates two periods uh, in this scientific cycle. So first you have what he calls normal science. That's where you know, uh, science usually is. So in a period of normal science, you have a paradigm that's well established and that's accepted by um, everybody or almost everybody in the community. And so everybody learns um, the paradigm in school, uh, based you know, in graduate school, using the textbook that uh, are written to describe the paradigm. Everybody uh, uses the paradigm, so the model says that the paradigm um, is based on in their research. People, uh, all the scientists look at the facts that the paradigm is interested in. All the scientists use the research methods uh, that the paradigm recommends. And, um, and so what do they do? you know, with their time using their methods and models, you have several things that you can do. Um, so one that often in the model uh, that's at the center of the paradigm, you have a bunch of uh, parameters or constant that need to be measured or estimated. So there's a bunch of time that's spent trying to measure these things uh, using uh, the data. Um, sometimes so the paradigm is also going to make uh, predictions about things that, you know, uh, how the world is supposed to work. And so some scientists also spend time kind of testing this prediction or trying to see whether um, the world out there uh, is in line with the predictions that the model makes. And then if the model is right like this, then it's perfect. If the facts are not exactly consistent with the prediction of the model, then you need to uh, first, go back to the model and further articulate the model, develop, extend it to try to match and describe properly these new uh, observations. So some time is spent on this kind of articulation of the prevailing paradigm uh, or extension of it. Um, so, you know, these are the things that uh, people do during this time of normal sense, kind of better understanding of the, of the model, the prevailing model, further articulation, extension, development of the model to match uh, new facts uh, that have been unearthed by uh, people who look at the data. Um, so this is really um, what people do uh, most of the time. Except that at some point, you know, people, so people keep on looking, the scientists keep on looking at the world around them through the lens of the paradigm. And at some point, you know, over time, you start to discover puzzles, which are um, empirical facts, regularities, observations that cannot really be easily reconciled with uh, the theory or the model. But, you know, you may have a first puzzle, a first anomaly that pops up. People try to extend the paradigm to 
explain it, but it's not always possible to do it uh, easily. Then so you have a first anomaly, first puzzle that's listed, and then you may have another one, another one, and yet another one. Um, and at some point, when there are too many anomalies, too many you know, facts that cannot really be explained or described properly with a padding, some people start um, looking for a different uh, padding, a different way to explain the world. Um, and when we get to that stage, we are going to move away from the normal and tranquil state of normal science to move into revolutionary uh, revolutionary episodes, uh, revolutionary science. So that's when the existing paradigm has to compete with new paradigms that have been created to try to explain these anomalies that have been observed. Um, so in the case of um, astronomy, which was what um, Kuhn was first interested in, this happened in the 1500 when um, you know, there were a lot of anomalies with uh, um, standard you know, geocentric view of the world, you know, with the Earth in the middle of the universe and then the stars and the planets on the second bigger sphere. Um, so there were a lot of anomalies that had been isolated for you know, a long time and uh, Copernicus proposed a different system, an heliocentric system with the sun in the middle and the planets rotating around the sun. Then we entered the period of revolutionary science where the two camps, people who believed in the Copernican system and people who believed in the old uh, two-sphere systems uh, fought with each other to try to decide you know, which uh, view of the world was going to prevail. And of course, the Copernicans won, but it, it took a long time you know, for more than 100 years after uh, Copernicus had proposed the Copernican system. And of course, you know, he died uh, just as his uh, book was being published, but other people, some of his students and, and other scientists took, uh, took over and you know, fought to try to uh, promote the Copernican system. It took more than 100 years for it to be accepted. And what really you know, pushed, you know, made them win was, the, was actually uh, the observation by uh, Galileo. Uh, and so Galileo, because he had invented like a small telescope, he was able to observe the stars and the planets much better. And the observations that he made actually convinced people that yes, indeed, the Copernican system was better than the old uh, Ptolemaic system. Uh, but so that was that period of revolutionary science actually took uh, quite a lot of time. Uh, so it's not something that's resolved overnight. Um, so when you have a period of revolution, people come up with one alternative padding or several alternative padding, and there's a big fight to decide kind of within the community to decide who is going to take over. Um, and, and often, after a while, one paradigm emerges that's going to replace the old paradigm. And then once that paradigm is adopted, then you have a new period of normal science that takes over where people are going to further define, you know, refine the paradigm, use it to look at new research questions and you know, isolate new anomalies. And then until it's time for a new period of revolutionary science, where new paradigms are going to be proposed and possibly um, possibly take over. So you have this science, in fact, doesn't evolve linearly, but evolves through cycles of periods of normal science, when you have one prevailing paradigm, revolutionary science, where you have several paradigms that coexist at the same time, and scientists, you know, are split in different camps that are trying, you know, that are fighting each other um, and try to push for their own uh, view of the world, their own um, paradigm, until one wins and we get a new period of um, normal science.